Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom uh, on this mixture of a happy and sad occasion. Uh, the happy thing is that I have to say to Lord Mans, happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's not often that we say that at a valedictory in this court, but of course Lord Mans has chosen to soldier on until the very last minute, and we are grateful to him for doing so. This is typical of his dogged persistence in anything and everything that he does. As tennis playing colleagues and friends will know, he is notorious for running after balls which most people would abandon. Just in the hope of being able to hit them back, and in fact, he often manages to do this, to the astonishment of all, and sometimes even hitting those opponents who have unwisely turned their backs and started walking back to the baseline. <laughs> that same dogged persistence is his great virtue as a judge. He's anxious to get to the bottom of every point and to answer it correctly. His intellectual honesty is legendary. Not for him the easy answer, which will produce the result that he wants or thinks just. It has to be the right answer. Si responsum erit verum, et rua coilum. If the answer be correct, let the heavens fall, might be his motto. His devotion to duty is shown by the huge contribution which he has made to the work of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. He has frequently sat there and presided there more often than any of us. He's visited both the Bahamas and Mauritius with the board, Indeed, he led the most recent visit to the Bahamas with great distinction, including inspecting a guard of honor with aplomb. And he, with Jacob Turner, has written the definitive guide to Privy Council practice, available from all good publishers now. <laughs> and I'm going to ask him to uh, autograph my own personal copy uh, today. So it is fitting, indeed, that his last case is in the Privy Council. And not only that, but also that it is a case which perfectly plays to his expertise. It concerns attempts to enforce in Jersey arbitral awards worth millions of US dollars made in disputes about the construction of an oil pipeline which would be met by pleas of state immunity. Commercial contracts, arbitration, international law, what could be more fitting? I gather that Jonathan dabbled in everything, including matrimonial work when he started out at the bar, but after a somewhat searing outing before one registrar butler loss, I wonder what happened to her, <laughs> he decided to concentrate on commercial work with huge success. And it was in that capacity that he joined the Law Lords in 2005 to fill the vacancy left by the retirement of Johann Stein. But he's done much more than that for the court. In particular, he's been our ambassador to foreign and supranational courts, participating in numerous exchanges particularly with our European neighbours, and also the USA in this. In this, his fluency in German and French and his foreignness for foreign languages in general have been a great asset. I well remember when we were visited uh, by a high-ranking officer in the German army. Our director of communications explained that Lord Mans would meet the delegation because he spoke some German. <laughs> oh no, said Lord Mans, I speak German. <laughs> <laughs> and it was through a German lawyer Wolfgang Burkhardt, that he met his wife, Mary Arden. Jonathan had met him skiing, well, that's typical, isn't it? Uh, and Mary had met him at a summer course in Leiden. Burkhardt recognized that they were made for one another and sent Jonathan a postcard telling him that he should seek her out after she returned from her postgraduate studies in the States, adding, I hope it works out. Well, he did, and it did. 
Having known Mary for even longer than Jonathan has, I know how very well suited they are intellectually and in every way. And they continue to amaze all their colleagues with the strength of the Chinese wall they maintain between one another when it comes to their cases. It's such a pleasure to welcome Mary here today, together with all three of their children, their son and daughter-in-law, and three out of their four grandchildren, as well as two of Jonathan's sisters. Devoted family man though he is, I gather that he does not display his usual dogged persistence when it comes to shopping. <laughs> and he's well known in the family for terminating any shopping trip within minutes with a peremptory, I think we'll leave it. <laughs> but one could possibly, no one could possibly say that about his judicial work, where he's not only dogged in his pursuit of the correct answer, but also remarkably creative in thinking of solutions which have not occurred to anyone else. Lord Clark had a word for them, Mansion, and it fits. We shall all miss his Mansion insights, the huge range of his international interests and activities, his concern to help the young lawyers who work with us to develop their talents to the full, and his kindness to us all. And we're also very glad that the vicissitudes of the judicial retirement ages have meant that he could serve for most of this legal year as Deputy President of the Court in which he's been invaluable to me and to everyone here. He will still have plenty of unfinished business when he leaves the court, but he will also have time to return to the House of Lords where his unrivaled understanding of European Union law and the workings of the Court of Justice of the European Union will surely be much in demand. Our loss is their gain. We wish him well. Thank you very much. Sissini. May it please your ladyship, it's a particular pleasure to me to be able to speak today because I first knew Jonathan Mance when he was a junior on the brink of silk. Silk soon followed and I then knew him as a promising young silk. The promise having been fulfilled, he made his rapid rise through all the ranks of the, of the judiciary. Apart from that, that rise, he has he has many honours and distinctions, honorary fellowships, honorary degrees, one of them an honorary doctorate in civil law from the University of Oxford. People have sometimes asked me, what sort of a judge was Jonathan Mance? And I found that the best response to that was to be found in the address of the public orator at Oxford in giving in presenting him for that degree. This is how the public orator started. Do you suppose that all judges are bleak persons, grim of brow, whose gloomy pleasure is to dispatch malefactors to the dungeons? If so, please take a careful look at this man. You often see a smile on, on his lips and a twinkle in his eyes. Nonetheless, his judgments are weighty and his legal learning is deep. Who could have put it better than that? Of course, uh, as I said, Amah, he, has, he has many honors. One of them is that he holds the office of High Steward of Oxford <laughs> University, which is an office of very vague duties, but undoubted, uh, undoubted eminence. Indeed, one of his predecessors in the office was, I think, Lord Bingham. Now, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to talk about Lord, Lord Mance's Lord Mance's abilities on the bench because it's some time now since I've seen him there. But what I can say and what I can remember of him was that notwithstanding that twinkle in the eye, he was a very, very formidable judge. Many years ago, a professor of jurisprudence wrote that the English doctrine of precedent is acceptable only because of a general perception that on the whole, the bench is more learned than the bar. <laughs> that, 
That, of course, has always been my own perception, but, <laughs> <laughs> but seldom, seldom more so than appearing before Jonathan Mance in all his judicial manifestations. His learning was indeed, indeed deep. It's difficult, really, to put one's finger on it. In court, he never flaunted his learning. He never set out to make counsel feel uncomfortable. And yet, there was something about it that sometimes discomforted one. It was, a, all I can say about it is that he seemed always to be ahead of one's argument. He knew what we were going to say. He knew he could say it better than we, he, than we were saying it if he wanted to. He knew what we were going to say. He knew what the answers were going to be, and he knew what the replies were going to be to that. So he was, if I, if I may say so, as someone who has appeared before many judges in many places, I, I would call him one of our great judges. Now, I've, I have limited time, I know, because I'm, I'm going to be followed by distinguished counsel, who are, I assume, on the same side as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so all I can say now is that he is retiring now on what, to me at least, seems a ridiculously early age. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what he is going to do on retirement, uh, and I would n not presume for a moment to give him any advice on it. I will simply say one thing to him really to get the best out of retirement, one has to develop a talent for idleness. <laughs> <laughs> it's a talent which hitherto I don't think that Jonathan Mance has cultivated. But whatever he does, I think I am, can say on behalf of the whole legal profession that his contributions to law and to justice will not soon be forgotten. And I think, again, I can speak on behalf of the profession in wishing him many happy years of retirement. Lord Panic. My ladies and my lords, uh, I am on the same side of the case uh, as Sir Sidney. And as his junior, there is an almost irresistible temptation simply to say, I have nothing uh, to add. But I won't, because uh, given the significance, the importance of the occasion, I wish to underline the submissions that the court has already heard. Uh, when Justice Blackman announced his retirement from the United States Supreme Court uh, in 1994, Justice Souter issued a public statement. And it said simply, I dissent. <laughs> And on the retirement of Lord Mance, the legal community will wish to express a similar sentiment. Uh, my lady's already mentioned the observations of Lord Mansfield in the case of the Queen and Wilkes in 1770. He also said in that case, I never give a judicial opinion upon any point until I think I am master of every material argument and authority relative to it. Uh, from the bar, it often seemed that my lord, Lord Mance, had mastered the issues and the authorities uh, by the time of the hearing. And there have been few judges in my professional lifetime who had a more comprehensive knowledge of so many areas of the law uh, as Lord Mance, and indeed the laws of so many other lands. Uh, advocates have frequently been unable to return Lord Mance's serve when he asked uh, the questions to which your lordship well knew the answer. What is the position in French law uh, or in German law? Your lordship has also demonstrated admirable patience uh, with the bar. Uh, the most your lordship could be provoked to say 
was, as in a recent appeal, uh, in response to a lengthy submission from my opponent, or it may have been a lengthy submission from me, I can't remember, your Lordship said, we have probably got that point by now. <laughs> well, this audience has probably got my point by now. Uh, one final matter. Uh, your Lordship's knowledge of EU law is unsurpassed uh, on the bench, in part because of your Lordship's role before the summer of 2009 as chairman of a House of Lords EU subcommittee. Uh, Sir Sidney mentioned retirement. I hope it won't be too idle a, a retirement because one happy consequence of your Lordship's retirement from this court is that your Lordship will have the opportunity to return to a role in the House of Lords, though knowledge of EU law is, I fear, an asset of depreciating value. Uh, my lady, my lords, on behalf of the bar, I too wish your Lordship a long and happy retirement from judicial office. Thank you, Lord Panic. Mr Knox. My lady, uh, today is a, a very sad day for all of us who have had uh, the honour of appearing from time to time in the Privy Council. Uh, it is not just uh, that Lord Mance has been a great supporter of the institution, that is true. It is not just his complete mastery, as uh, Sir Sidney and uh, Lord Panic have referred to, of the law and of the often disorganised record that you get in cases coming up to the Privy Council where all the documents are in the wrong order and very difficult to find. Nor even is it just the clarity and penetration of his judgments which have done so much to develop the law across the Caribbean and in Mauritius and elsewhere. They will live on forever. Uh, what I will particularly recall, which is something which unfortunately we will never have again from Lord Mance, is his unfailing courtesy and especially good humour which has always made it such a pleasure to appear in front of him. Even when he thinks you are talking complete nonsense, he puts it in terms that the outside world will not recognize. <laughs> I was uh, forcefully apprised of this the first time I appeared in front of Lord Mance in a freedom of expression case uh, from Trinidad uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, my position on behalf of the state more or less was that indeed everyone is entitled to this freedom, but not necessarily equally. Uh, he described my submissions as valiant. A friend of mine who took a passing interest in the law was extremely impressed. <laughs> he thought this was a compliment. <laughs> I, I didn't have the heart to tell him that it meant not only were my submissions hopeless, but I went on far too long in making them. <laughs> uh, although I should add, even to this day, I still think they were entirely correct. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, I did some background research for my short address today. And my first port of call uh, was Lord Mance as he was before he went to the bench. So I asked Brian Marie, an eminent attorney in the Bahamas, who had come across Lord Mance when he appeared there many years ago, uh, on behalf of the auditors of the Banco Ambrosiano, if there was anything he would like to say. The auditors were being sued by the liquidators, and Mr. Marie was acting as a sort of co-defendant, as I understand it, for Mr. Roberto Calvi. Uh, Mr. Marie told me that Lord Mance had spent several months ensconced, as he put it, in Paradise Island, and had appeared in the Supreme Court there and had successfully defended the auditors against the liquidators' claims. Uh, I must say, uh, if popular prejudice is anything to go by, uh, that sounds like a very good win indeed. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, Lord Mance, he told me, had made, and I quote, a huge impression on the local community and those Bahamian lawyers he had come into contact with. Uh, I speculate, but perhaps that interlude played some part in Lord Mance's later enthusiasm for the Caribbean and the Privy Council. That enthusiasm was apparent to all of us who appeared in front of him and shows itself not only in his judgments, but in his concise masterpiece published only last year, Privy Council Practice, uh, to which my lady has already referred. There is one footnote, though, uh, that I particularly enjoy. It has to do with a case from St. Kitts and Nevis a couple of years ago, in which the Privy Council, at very short notice, was convened at the request of the appellants, for whom a large team of us appeared, in order to stop a general election. The allegation was that a law, or purported law, changing the electoral boundaries, 
passed suddenly and without proper notice to the opposition MPs only hours before the calling of the election had not been properly proclaimed and anyway, we said, was unconstitutional. Lord Mance was in the chair and as you can imagine, there was sustained questioning, not least from him, as to whether the board could possibly intervene to stop a general election. Surely that is a step too far. In the end, however, all went well for us, and the board granted an interlocutory injunction restraining the calling of the election on the new boundaries, <coughs> with the result that instead it took place on the old boundaries. The opposition won, when otherwise, under the new boundaries, they would unquestionably have lost. But to return to the footnote, Lord Mance observes as follows. JCPC hearings can also be watched live in the following URL. He gives the details. And significant JCPC judgments are available to watch on YouTube. The decision in Brantley v. Constituency Boundaries Commission, determining the boundaries under which a general election should, should take place in St. Kitts and Nevis, with a population of around 55,000, has been viewed over 5,800 times. And that, I should add, was only in July 2017. I imagine it's now about 10,000. I should add, I, perhaps I don't want to disappoint Lord Mance, it's about 4,000 of those, is probably my good self. <laughs> <laughs> Reliving one of the few triumphs I had in front of him. Uh, uh, but so for myself, I think there is perhaps a much greater importance in the work of the Privy Council uh, than is sometimes appreciated. It has the most enormous respect in the Caribbean, and I think, too, it adds something to the experience and reputation of the Supreme Court that its judges decide and pay such careful attention to the cases that come up to it from the Caribbean, Mauritius, and elsewhere. Finally, I would just like to pass on the comments I received from those uh, whom I asked who practice in the Privy Council if there was any message uh, that they would like to convey to Lord Mance on this occasion. Their answers were unanimously to the effect that they would like to thank Lord Mance for his commitment to and enthusiasm for the work of the Privy Council and his understanding of its importance to the Caribbean and to express immense gratitude for, and I quote from one in particular, his extremely engaging and polite treatment of all parties appearing in Privy Council matters. Uh, for myself, I can only add my thanks and profound admiration. Thank you. Lord Mance. Thank you all for coming to court at so unfamiliar an hour. <clears throat> it's a delight to see you all. Thank you for the undeservedly kind words. Thank you to our president, Brenda, Lady Hale, <clears throat> with whom I valued and enjoyed being able to work, particularly, of course, over the last legal year as deputy. It was a particular pleasure to hear once again <clears throat> from Sir Sidney Kentridge, who I've admired uh, and all my professional life, we first worked together, as he described, nearly 40 years ago, both then juniors. He intended to lead me. When I suddenly took silk, we had quickly to split the clients between us, enabling him, in half an hour's cross-examination, to demonstrate that a claimant invoking an insurance principle of good faith should not falsify his CV. <laughs> Last time Sir Sidney addressed this court was on his 90th birthday. He has um, the gift of putting ideas into a judge's mind uh, in a way uh, which um, ensures that she or he thinks that they had thought of it first. <laughs> to someone about to retire, uh, to see him again here today is wonderfully encouraging. David Panic has also been prominent among leaders in this court, not least perhaps in the most publicized public law case of my experience, the Article 50 or Gina Miller case. Uniquely, we sat there as 11, one of us having retired, and uniquely, we feature in an annual calendar about the case uh, with David Panic as number 12. <laughs> Finally, thank you to Peter Knox, a leader of that bar, which he's described largely unheralded outside its own world, but specializing in the mastery at short notice of an immensely varied and often very taxing workload from 30 overseas jurisdictions, including three republics. Uh, he mentioned um, the state of the documents, um, and that, of course, um, invokes uh, Stephen Sedley's uh, rule of documents that they shall always be placed in the reverse 
order, uh, that they shall always be uh, muddled up, that the electronic and the hard copy bundle shall never correspond, and so on. <laughs> But thanks really are all due all round to my colleagues who've made life collegiate and even disagreement <coughs> stimulating and whose company has been so generally rewarding, to our administration, first led by Jenny Rowe and now by Mark Ormrod with William Arnold as their assistant, <coughs> and led on the judicial side by our registrar, Louise de Mambro and her ever willing team, and thanks to our personal assistants, particularly mine, Jackie Sears, all of you have always gone the extra mile. To all the rest of our staff, thanks, so please excuse me if I just single out um, uh, two uh, elements, our security staff, because it is they who we see every morning arriving at court and whose friendly helpless, helpfulness goes beyond, far beyond the bare necessities, and our press officers, they've both been integral to the court's successful outreach. Finally, and particularly uh, thanks to all my judicial assistants, uh, so many of whom I'm delighted to see here today, including two of you uh, who are um, German comparative lawyers who I persuaded to come and uh, do a short internship with the court. It is really delightful that you've come for this occasion, and I'm touched. Uh, I shall greatly miss the relationships with judicial assistants when I no longer have one, but we will keep in touch. <clears throat> 13 years in the highest court could have led to institutionalization, but they've in fact been years of constant change. The first four, as you've heard, spent in the House of Lords, where I was the last in the tradition of law lords to chair subcommittee E. Uh, we wrote um, a, or contributed largely to a massive report on the forthcoming Treaty of Lisbon. That was all a very instructive responsibility, but judges are not entitled to be legislators, and I've never looked back after the court moved here. Uh, Lord Hope, Lady Hale, and I were the subcommittee liaising with the administration over arrangements for this um, court. With great expert help, I believe we got most things right. And once here, life has been a regular change of individuals, always stimulating, and the continuous development of new working methods, methods internally and externally. Uh, Lord Phillips and Lord Hope started and departed as president and deputy. L Lord Newberger and Lady Hale succeeded. And during the last year, I've had the privilege of being deputy and have see had the pleasure of seeing new colleagues refresh our ranks. What I think the court has done is give the law a profile, give the public a better idea of what it is about, the careful resolution of difficult issues based on respect for authority and the identification and application of sound principles, not on political or personal preferences. That's what we've certainly aimed to pioneer with widespread webcasting of hearings, video linked hands down, hand downs and press handouts and it's what I think the Gina Miller case stood for, uh, whether you agree with the majority or the minority. I'm the first lawyer in my family. I got to Oxford to read history and changed to law for unsound reasons. Uh, over the summer holiday, I'd read John Brain's Carry On Down, the story of a graduate with a history degree who ended up washing the windows of his own old school. Perhaps even more persuasively, my father, an economist by training, had told me that he had tried law in his spare time during the war and found it made him sleep. <laughs> I, I saw that as a challenge, and in the event, my college was lucky enough to have as tutors Professors Tony Guest and Lenny Hoffman. With them, law was certainly not boring. And when I came to the Lords, there, of course, I found Lord Hoffman once again marking my papers. <laughs> So uh, I'm not much prone to looking back, but each case has, each phase has been as engaging as the previous. I suppose that um, if I've contributed at all uh, beyond hearing and deciding uh, uh, an almost endless variety of individual cases, it has been in the international sphere, which might descend from a family tradition of activity all over the world by a generation which I knew well but has now passed away. At any rate, when I finished at Oxford, I rejected domestic possibilities and went instead as an intern to a Hamburg law firm and after that on a six-week course on EU law in Luxembourg, years before the UK joined. 
Ever since then, I've had German friends of whom the very best, um, Helmut Stanger, is uh, here today, and another of whom, Wolfgang Burkhardt, um, uh, later introduced me, as you've heard, to Mary and became our best man. I suspect that it might have been difficult to, to divert uh, Mary's dedicated professional eye from the matter at hand had we met across a courtroom. Uh, luckily, we didn't, and by and large, we've avoided talking too much law. I want to express my enormous debt to her for all the support, hard work, and organization that has enabled her to conduct a successful career of her own and to bring up three children, all here today, two of them with the majority of their families, uh, who are behaving extremely well, <laughs> and, <laughs> as well as put up with me. She has a breadth of achievement and a capacity for multitasking of which I am incapable. As a silk at the bar, you're the head of a team, spending, in my case, as you heard, quite long periods abroad. Some people think the bench lonely in comparison, but the aim and art of managing your own court is to foster a different sort of team cooperation. The bench is an opportunity to put something back into the system to shape the law and to embark on a new, though allied, progression. It would be sad and, I think, permanently detrimental to the common law if a shift in attitudes at the bar should cloud successful barristers' interest in the bench, which I have certainly found an internally stimulating experience. Certainly in my first case as a commercial judge, I never felt lonely, even if I felt tested, in the company of counsel who included Lord Irvin, my future colleague Lord Briggs, the future Lord Justice Christopher Clarke, and two future High Court judges, Andrew Popplewell and Stephen Silver. The case, in fact, bookended my commercial court career, starting with months-long interlocutory challenges and ending it five years later with a six-month trial. It involved a fraud on the Kuwait Investment Office using its Spanish subsidiaries, Grupo Torres. My Spanish cousin reminded me last week that the Spanish press described me at the time as un hombre serio entre en el medio del caos. He thinks that serio is best translated as reasonable, not serious, um, uh, but um, not a bad professional editor, part half, um, I uh, would like to have, have, even though most cases are more about ordinary human vicissitudes than chaos. I would like to pick out one international theme which I valued and feel has done some good. From 2000, I was, uh, for 12 years, the UK's representative on the Council of Europe's new Consultative Council of European Judges. The members were, of course, predominantly civilian judges, but I served for its first three years as its elected chair. In our very first opinion, we wrote that the importance for national legal systems and judges of the obligations resulting from international treaties, such as the European Convention and also the European Union treaties, makes it vital that the appointment and reappointment of judges to the courts interpreting such treaties should command the same confidence and respect the same principles as national legal systems. In that, in our fifth opinion, we advocated the involvement of an independent selecting authority with substantial judicial representation in relation to all such appointments to international courts. In 2002, we were approached by the Judicial Integrity Group in collaboration with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Independence of Judges to obtain civil law input into ongoing work to produce a draft code of conduct for judges. We persuaded the Judicial Integrity Group to prepare, rather than the code, principles of judicial conduct and had considerable input into the content. The Bangalore principles received United Nations endorsement in 2006 and have had worldwide influence being included explicitly in the guides to professional conduct issued by the English and Welsh judiciary, as well as by the Supreme Court. I joined the Judicial Integrity Group myself, and we produced a commentary in 2009 and a guide to implementation and are working on, with the UN on possible updating. In 2009, the Treaty of Lisbon introduced Article 255 of the TFEU, of which the UK was a principal promoter and which has since acquired a Strasbourg homologue. And that provides for a seven-person panel to report on the suitability of candidates for appointment as judges or advocates general at the European Court of Justice. And from uh, March 2010 till this February, I served as a member of that panel. And um, 
I think that panel has been significant. It remains, of course, a nation state's prerogatives to nominate candidates, but the process of the panel has had a marked effect on national selection processes as well as on candidates nominated and appointed. We could only be overridden unanimously by all EU governments, and that, of course, never occurred. Uh, we rejected quite a high percentage of new candidates nominated. Uh, we operated under the redoubtable presidency of the head of the Conseil d'État, Jean-Marc Sauvé, who himself just retired on the 28th of May, and its fellow members included latterly the president of the German Constitutional Court. The friendships made on it have encouraged some very fruitful exchanges by the Supreme Court with both the Conseil d'État and the Bundesverfassungsgericht. With Brexit coming, I'm presumably the first and last ever UK member of that panel, but happily, I will not be the only ever common law member since the Council of Ministers has had the very good sense to replace me with the Chief Justice of Ireland, Frank Clark. And that is, I think, significant. The common law is one of the world's great systems, but in Europe it has been, and with Brexit will be even more, a minority interest. Nevertheless, anyone who spent time with judges and lawyers from other systems, European and worldwide, knows that there is enormous respect for the common law, respect for its stability, its adaptability, and its pragmatism. We must certainly continue the regular exchanges with the US judiciary and common law and other judiciaries outside Europe that have been so enriching. And I'm confident that the Privy Council will also continue to sit from time to time uh, abroad. But it is vital that we continue the good relations inside Europe Interchanges under the aegis of membership of the EU will not, of course, be possible after Brexit, but my successors will, I'm sure, find other contact points, perhaps in other fora, such as the Council of Europe, but where necessary, bilateral. One thing is clear. A continuing understanding of EU law and the continuing quality and the composition of the membership of the judges on the Court of Justice of the European Union underpinned to a degree by the Article 255 panel, is going to be relevant and in the public eye for some time. It's been an enormous privilege to take part in the exposition, application, and where appropriate development of the common law. I certainly hope to undertake some proper retirement activities, including uh, learning a talent for idleness. Uh, but in addition uh, to my regular ho hobbies, um, music, walking, tennis, um, acquiring perhaps some cooking skills, taking a regular part in a choir, improving my Spanish, and of course, entertaining grandchildren. But I do also hope to continue to contribute to the law in some form, although I would certainly not compare myself with Ulysses, quite apart from some, some particular trays which he had. I do share his view that it is difficult to shake off a lifetime's engagement completely particularly when my other half is clearly going to continue for some years. Odysseus, having at last returned to uh, supposed retirement in Ithaca, Tennyson put these words into his mouth. I am a part of all that I have made, met. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. However that may be, the Supreme Court will, I'm confident, also continue to shine in its continued use with my successors. I can only repeat how hugely enriching as well as prejudicable it has been to participate in its development since 2009 as a fully-fledged institution. I wish it and you all the very best, and thank you once again for being here. Thank you. Can we all give him a round of applause? now adjourned.